If you have your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews chapter 6. In our last study, we concluded in verses 11 and 12 where we read, and I'll read it ahead as you are turning there. And we desire, the author of Hebrews writes, that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, and that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those through faith and patience inherit the promises. And this is the heart of the Lord for us. This is the heart of the Lord being communicated today. It should be the heart of anyone that pastors a church. Did you notice the instruction there in verses 11 and 12, that the members of the body of Christ be diligent in their relationship with the Lord until the end? And there was also a warning. So there was instruction, and there was also a warning, a heads up, watch out. Don't become sluggish. Don't become complacent. Don't allow your light to be dimmed. Don't compromise. This is so important. You know, sluggish is a very interesting word here. It's what would be used to describe maybe how you felt getting up this morning after a late night last night. Ah, I'm feeling a little sluggish. I'm still in a little bit of a brain fog. You know, I shouldn't have stayed up so late last night. You know, the other, other day that Ruth and I were talking about, I asked her, I said, did you ever pull all-nighters in college studying? And, you know, if you've ever done that, you know how terrible of a feeling that is. You feel clammy and you feel like pale. And, you know, I'm white and I'm even paler than my whiteness. You know, and you just feel sick. And it's a terrible feeling sluggish when I try to think. I'm like, what is the word that I'm looking for? I'm indexing, you know, my, my vocabulary, and I can't seem to find that word. You know, it drives me crazy that, you know, after that conversation's over, I'll be doing something. I'm like, aha, my brain finally caught up. There it is. But sluggish really just means everything that you would think that it would mean. Slow moving, inactive, without energy, and not alert. Now, we all have felt like that, time, you know, in times physically. At times we feel, oh man, I'm just not where I should be. But the devil especially loves it when we're like that spiritually. When you're spiritually sluggish. You know, slow to move. Let's just look at that. Slow to move. So when God tells us to do something, we should be doing it the first time without having to be reminded You know, if I commit to something, I should be faithful to follow through with it, not procrastinate. You know, I never forget seeing that, you know, that t-shirt. I forget where I was at, but it said, you know, procrastinators of the world unite tomorrow. You know, that kind of thing. You know, and sometimes the Lord tells us to do something and we just put it off. You know, I'll get around to it or I know that's right, but, you know, I'm kind of busy right now. Satan loves that in the life of a Christian. Additionally, we see inactive. And this would be the antithesis of an active faith, meaning I'm saying a lot, but I'm not doing a lot. And that not doing in the life of a Christian is directly connected to my lack of faith in the Lord because I'm not taking steps of faith. I'm not taking steps outside my comfort zone. I can tell you as a church and for those that have been involved with this, We're taking active steps of faith as a church. I think Satan would love for us to not do that. You know, what if we're without spiritual energy? And you know, this is a very hard thing to overcome when in a church there is no energy there. But the word energy isn't speaking of some cosmic, you know, thing. It's actually speaking spiritually of vitality and life to be alive spiritually, to be excited about the things of the Lord, to be singing when the songs are sung and engaged in the word of God and learning and receiving. And then when you're out of here, you don't fall off. You know, energy is speaking of a expectation for the Lord to move, to hear your prayers, for you to meet with him. Spiritual life. So I don't want to be slow to move. I don't want to be inactive. I don't want to be without energy. And I, fourthly, do not want to be insensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit because I'm not alert. I'm not alert. 
Because when you're slow to move and you're inactive in your faith and when, when you're without spiritual vibrancy in life, you'll find that you are dull to the things of the Lord and you're completely missing the things that are happening right in front of you or all around you. We don't want that. I wonder if any of you here today have felt sluggish as of late or maybe for some time. You know, as I was preparing and praying over this message and as the Lord was speaking to me through it, and that's, the, that's really the cool thing about being a pastor that teaches through the Bible because even if you don't get anything out of the message, it really doesn't matter to me because I already did. The Lord already spoke to me. And hopefully from that, I'm able to communicate with a personal conviction, the truths of God's word. But as the Lord was speaking to me through that, I strongly felt that this needed to be brought to our attention so that we, as this modern day church, could imitate those men and women of great faith who have gone before us. In the context of our study in the letter to the Hebrews, there's an encouragement given to the church to be like those great men and women of faith who endured, who had patience, who had faith. You know, if I were to pick probably two of the most difficult things for Christians to do, right at the top, would be two things that we just read of in verse 12. To have faith and to have patience. Would you agree with that in some, to some extent in your own life? To have faith and to have patience. I mean, these two things really go hand in hand, don't they? I mean, how am I to be patient when I'm waiting? Well, the answer is to have faith in the Lord. Trust that he will bring that to pass. How am I to have faith in the Lord when I don't see anything right now? Well, the answer is for you to be patient. They do go hand in hand, faith and patience. See, faith and patience are the two things that everyone needs but that no one wants to use. I need faith, I need patience, but if you were to ask me if I wanted to utilize my faith and patience, I'd probably say that's not the easiest thing to do. But if you're in a place of spiritual sluggishness, then look to the promises of the Lord. And there you will find the two things that you need to receive the promises of the Lord, which just so happen to be what? Guess what? Faith and patience. When I exercise my faith, I'm no longer slow to move because I'm moving. Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said, you don't have enough faith. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. You know, my mom gave me this little keychain, this tiny little one, but it has a mustard seed in it. And it is a tiny little speck. It's from Israel. And every time I look at that keychain, I'm reminded of what Jesus said. Faith moves mountains. If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, and I'm like, oh, Lord, please help me. How could I not have faith the size of a, you know, the head of a, of a needle, a little pin needle? Like, how? But faith moves. When you exercise your faith, guess what? You're no longer inactive. There's an amazing poem. I don't know who the author is. It's unknown, but it says, passive faith but praises in the light when the sun does shine. Active faith will praise in the darkest night, which faith is thine? So I'll praise the Lord when things are all sunny and going well, but active faith is when it's not going well and I'm surrounded by darkness. When your faith is active, you will find, guess what? The accompanying strength of the Lord to stay active. It's very similar, spiritually speaking, to when you're physically tired and you don't want to work out. You know, for those of us that started our New Year's re resolutions or whatever, we're like, I'm going to exercise. You know how hard it is to exercise when you're tired? Oh, man, I'm just not feeling motivated. I don't have the willpower. I'm feeling tired. It's so much easier just to sit on the couch or to put my feet up. I've worked all day, whatever it might be. 
And there are a lot of excuses for not going and doing it. But interestingly enough, and you probably, if you push through those feelings of, I don't want to do this and actually did something, you work out anyway. With it comes a surge of energy that lasts hours after you're done training. It's true. So you might come home exhausted and you're like, oh man, I'm gonna have to hop on the bike or do the rower or go for a walk or whatever. And I'm really not feeling it. You go out and do it and guess what happens? Your brain turns on. All of a sudden, oxygen is pumping. Your brain is alert. Your heart's beating. You're taking breaths. Your lungs are exercising. You're moving your muscles in a, hey, I'm starting to feel good. But the greatest enemy to activity is just inactivity, where it's easier for me to just sit there and do nothing. I'm sluggish and, you know, whatever, you know, I got this or I got that or whatever other excuse we want to make. So one of the greatest enemies to having energy is inactivity. And when your faith is being exercised, you'll find that, a, that there is a spiritual awareness that is a, that's elevated. When you're having to trust in the Lord, when you're engaged in reading your Bible and praying and evangelism and you're serving and you're giving and you're active, you're tuned in. When you're really going through it, and maybe some of you are struggling this morning, you're crying out to the Lord because you're in despair, you don't know what to do. You're very in tune for your need of a Savior. All of a sudden, spiritual things seem to be elevated in your life, don't they? Well, man, I haven't prayed in a long time, or I haven't read my Bible in a long time. I haven't gone to church in a long time. I haven't even done anything for the Lord in ages. You know, all of a sudden, I'm in a, pl all of a, sudden, I'm in a place of need, and then all at once, what happens? Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should be doing that. Oh, I should have changed. You know, yesterday I said tomorrow, and then I just strung a whole bunch of those tomorrows along, and look what's happened. Now all of a sudden, you're reading your Bible. You're praying. You're doing the things that make up a spiritually mature person. You're serving. You are giving. You are active. You're available. You're training. You're exercising. Your mind is now clear. I am able to see and sift through the spiritual fog that I was in for so long because the word of God has given me wisdom. He's given me understanding. My spiritual heart is beating. My lungs are breathing. I'm ready to go. Don't be sluggish. This is the point that's being made here. Looking unto Jesus, being reminded of his promises, exercising your faith as you wait patiently for the appointed time. And as you do all of those things, you will be charged, I would even say supercharged spiritually. I've made some adjustments in my own life. I know that you guys think that I'm perfect and I just can't allow you to think that for any longer. The Lord's been working in my life in things. I've made some adjustments that I've seen just amazing results from. Structuring my days differently, how I spend time with the Lord and in prayer, the things that the Lord will put on your heart to do are going to bring about spiritual dividends. I have found that in my own life, I probably have never had more responsibility or more things happening at the same time, yet the Lord has kept me in absolute peace. And that's from the Lord. It's a peace that goes beyond understanding. But you know, you don't usually find that place of where you need your Savior you don't find yourself in a place where you realize, I need more from the Lord and less of me until you get to a point where you have to make a decision of who you're going to be and what you're going to do. Going through the motions will not bring you ever what you need from the Lord. Compromising your relationship with the Lord so that you have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, so to speak, will never bring you what you need from the Lord. The Lord doesn't call you to follow him partially, but with your whole heart. 
Do not think that God has forsaken you or that he's not good on his promises. The author of Hebrews in verse 13, if you look down at your Bibles again, he uses Abraham as an example of God fulfilling his promises. He says, for when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessings I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after, it says in verse 15, that after Abram, Abram had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. That's the first book of the Bible. And chapter 12 comes coincidentally right after chapter 11. In chapter 12, Genesis, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. Verse two, Genesis 12. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. And so that's why we in our own way, support the nation of Israel. It's not saying that the nation of Israel is perfect. No one is perfect. No, not one. But we do know that God has a very special plan for his nation, Israel. We do know from this promise given to Abraham that Abraham, through his seed or his lineage, all the nations of the world would be blessed. If you put two and two together, you might think, ah, okay, Jesus, the Messiah of the seed of David, of the line of Abraham, from his seed, all the nations of the world would be blessed. That the Messiah would eventually come thousands of years after Abraham. Interesting. In Acts chapter 7, I'll read it to you, but if you like to turn there, I'll give you some pit stop verses along the way. Stephen, who was, one of the, who was the first martyr in the scriptures, as he is recounting, this story of Abraham. He says, brothers and fathers, listen to me. Our glorious God appeared to our ancestor Abraham in, Mesop in Mesopotamia before he settled in Haran. Acts 7, verse 3, God told him, leave your native land and your relatives and come into the land that I will show you. So Abraham, verse 4, Acts 7, left the land of the Chaldeans and he lived in Haran until his father died. Then God brought him here to the land where you now live. But God gave him no inheritance here, not even one square foot of land. God did promise, however, that eventually the whole land would belong to Abraham and his descendants, even though he had no children yet. And that's the real kicker now, isn't it? It's hard to have, it's hard to have a lineage when you have no lineage. You know, it's hard to have grandchildren when you can't even have a child. He had no kids, he was now over 100 years old, waiting patiently for the promise of the Lord. Honestly, in full disclosure, if I was Abraham, I would have thought I must have not heard correctly from the Lord or the Lord told me something that wasn't true. He promised that I would have a child. And now here I am, way past the age of being able to have children, 100 years old. That's a long time to be waiting on a promise from the Lord. He waited so long that it was absolutely impossible for him to have children. Do you realize the significance of this promise to Abraham and God's promise to you today? This always gets me. How the Lord will call us to do things that are impossible to even do at the get-go. Wait a second. You're asking me to do something that I am completely incapable of doing. The Lord will even allow things to get to the appointed time where that appointed time by the Lord is so past our ability to do anything. So at the get-go, I can't do that. And then if I think that I can, hey, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this and I'll move that and shake this and maybe I'll get there. You know, I, I'm good at taking care of problems. I'll figure out a way. The Lord allows things to get 
so far past your ability to move it a centimeter, a millimeter, the smallest microscopic measurement of progress. I can't do it. I'm probably in the negative already. From Abraham having a child when he was past the age, Joseph, when he should have been rotting in jail in Egypt, Joshua, and the walls of Jericho, I need these walls to fall down. They're the largest known walls to man and you have no tools. But I'm gonna have you walk around this city seven times and blow your trumpets. Don't touch a single thing. And the walls come tumbling down? Are you serious? How about Gideon and his 300 men? The enemies of, uh, uh, of, of Israel were already over 100, 130,000 maybe men. 32,000 men show up to the call to arms. The Lord whittles it down to 300. 300, Lord? Like I'm already in over my head, now 300 guys. And what does the Lord say? There's not gonna be one man among you who's, who's gonna be able to say, the strength of my own arm saved me. How about David and Goliath? Small, puny little kid with his slingshot. I'll get you, you giant, you know, whatever it might be. Goliath, who's this, I mean, I don't know if you saw on Instagram, I took a picture of a life-size uh, giant poster uh, from uh, Calvary Posters that was at a children's ministry conference that I attended with a couple of our people last, uh, last week. But I mean, I, I'm puny. Like, I look like I, I'm like up to his, almost to his waist. 10 foot tall nearly. Massive. And some little guy goes out there and fights him in the strength of the Lord. He says, I don't come to you except in the name of God whom you have defiled. How about the disciples being asked by Jesus to feed thousands of people when they had no food? Hey, you go give them something they eat. Could you imagine like looking at each other, them looking at each other like, Jesus just asked us to feed thousands of people and there is no food anywhere. We have a couple loaves and fish here, but what is that? The point that I'm making to you today is that there is a pattern in the scriptures that the Lord has set for us. The greatest works of the Lord are always preceded by a tremendous spiritual awareness of our incapability to save ourselves. It's always the case. The greatest works of the Lord take place in your life when they're preceded by you coming to a place where you realize it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. Lord, would you help me? Lord, would you provide for me? Lord, would you be my defense? Lord, would you please strengthen me? Because this causes us now to fall back upon the promises of the Lord to wait patiently and to wait patiently for them to be fulfilled. This is exactly what happened with Abraham for he had a son, his name was Isaac. He was the child of God's promise and it was from that line that the Messiah would bless all the nations of the world. God's promises are yes and yes, amen and amen. And it says, verse 16 here in Hebrews 6, for men indeed swear by the greater and an oath of, or an oath for confirmation is for them an end to all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, meaning it doesn't change, confirmed it by an oath that two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we have, or that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This means that your hope can be safely placed in the promises of the Lord because God's word never changes and he never goes back on his promises, ever. You know, when I was growing up, it's funny because, you know, having paired off children with Hudson and Ava at 14 and 12, and then Harrison, who just turned six, who, by the way, I have a six-year-old in the house now, in case you were wondering. So you got a six-year-old in the house. Oh, yes, I do. And his little brother, George. 
they'll bicker and they'll tease each other and they're screaming and yelling and throwing stuff and wrestling and yep, those are the pastor's kids too. They're just normal kids like everybody else. But it reminded me of when I was growing up with my brothers. You know, sometimes we would say um, that we were gonna do something but we would back out of it and say, I uh, I changed my mind. You know, we we would say, oh yeah, 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 I'm good for this, but then when it came down to it, oh no, I just, I, I changed my mind. And so we would have all kinds of fights as we tried to determine if someone was actually going to be good on their word. No, you can't change your mind. No, you can't say, oh, I don't want to do it now. We have to, you have to come up with this airtight saying. And so our brother, we worked through all of, it, all of this. It's funny how, you know, young brothers and siblings will do this kind of thing. But we came up with this airtight oath, which was this. If we said we were gonna do something, we had to take the oath that said, God's honest truth, no changing minds. And if we said that, that was it. You could never go back on that. And so in verse 16, you can understand exactly what he's talking about. Indeed, men will swear by something greater to end a dispute or an argument. Hey, okay, okay, you know, I swear on my mother's grave or I take an oath on the the offering that's on the altar or whatever it might be. But God has nothing greater than himself to take an oath upon. But he wanted to bring to Abraham such assurance and strong consolation that he swore by himself that he would fulfill his promises And in the same manner, we have been given a sure promise that the word of the Lord endures forever. We know that his promises are yes when he says yes, and they are no when he says no. And to that we say, amen. This isn't some fantasy world. This isn't some pretend or make-believe. This is the one true and living God who has given you his word that you might know what is right and what is wrong and the promises that he has made to you. And when you have that, you find that it's an anchor to your soul. It brings stability, consolation, assurance. When everybody's ping-ponging all over the place, you know, this is right today, but it's wrong tomorrow. Or I feel this way today, but I don't feel like that tomorrow. There is no stability there. There's no emotional stability. There is no mental stability. There's no physical stability. And there is, of course, no spiritual stability. Yet when you have the never-changing, always enduring word of God, that's why it says immutable. It just means he'll never change. His promises are true. His words are are true, they will never change. And so what he said yes to back then is still yes to right now. You will always know where you stand. And in the midst of a terrible raging storm in this world, in this life, you're anchored. And that's why he says in verse 19, the hope that we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has endured for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We touched on this interesting character a few weeks back. We will again next in our next uh, upcoming studies. But here you find your hope in the Lord. Here as you return again to God's word and you have your own relationship with him. In your time of need, In your time of great tribulation, you'll find that you're anchored in the deepest part of who you are. Because in our world, there are people that you can change your looks. You can change your pronouns. You can change your physical appearance and your physical Sexuality to some extent. But you will never, ever, ever be able to change who you are in the deepest part of your soul and spirit as a man or a woman that was created in the image of God. Everything else is superficial. Everything else is just a veneer. We're talking at a deeper level than your DNA which you can't change. 
in respect to how you were born. God created each person special, unique, for a great purpose. No one on the face of this earth can do better than you what God created you to do. Satan can't create, but he can maim, he can mar, he can taint, he can jade, he can destroy. But Jesus came that you might have life and life more abundantly. And so we read as we close this morning of these words, they are sure and they are steadfast. As they describe the hope that we have in the Lord, they also, guess what? They describe the state of the person who has this hope in the Lord, sure and steadfast. So on one hand, real quick as we wrap up here, sure and steadfast are the words of the Lord. If I have the word of the Lord, then now I am sure and steadfast in my life. That's why this is so important. Jesus is our great high priest, the only priest who is called great, the only priest who has passed through the heavens, the only high priest who is the son of God. And so we come boldly into the throne room, that throne of grace where we find mercy and help in time of need. Jesus was that forerunner. Jesus was the one that has gone before us so that we can go in with him. We enter into the throne room of heaven because, hey, I'm with Jesus. Jesus says he's with me. We find mercy and we find help. And the reason we're able to enter into the throne room of Almighty God is because Jesus has gone in before us. We enter in boldly because we enter in with, we enter behind and after Jesus. That's why we look to him. All right, Lord, where are we going? I've given you my word as a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. How will you stay cleansed? How will you stay pure? How will you stay holy? Look to the word of God. You will find everything that you need when you need it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, God, that we have that assurance, we have that consolation, and that we know your promises never fail, that your word endures forever. And so, Lord, I pray that if there are those, Lord, that are maybe wrestling through things or struggling with things today, Lord, that they would find their hope and assurance in you and that that would be the anchor for their soul. Lord, I ask that you would stir up each of our hearts today, Lord. Lord, the work is great, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I ask, Lord, that our church together as one family, as one unit, would work in unison to accomplish, Lord, what you have called us to accomplish. I pray, Lord, that you would bless our team meeting today. I pray, Lord, that you would even raise up new people to serve and to be involved. Lord, I pray over this first service coming on Thursday. I pray that there would be nothing that the devil would seek to do to stop this from happening. I pray, Lord, that you would protect us. I pray, Lord, that you would bless both campuses, Lord, those of us here in Orchard Hills, and then everything else that will happen during the week at the Bay Campus. Lord, we ask that this church would be a shining representation of what it means to be the light of the world. And Lord, I ask now that as we worship you, you would stir up our hearts. That if we're feeling sluggish, that we might exercise our faith and patience. And may, Lord, patience have its perfect work as we wait on you. And I ask these things, and we ask for these things in the name of Jesus. And all the church says, amen. Let's stand. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team will be available on my right, on your left. They love to come alongside and pray over anything that you might have as a need. On your way out today, if you want more information about the things that I shared with you, please stop by the information table or stop by and see me. I'd love to meet you if we've not yet met yet, and I'll point you in the right direction. And then hopefully you can join us at 2 p.m. today. If not, there will be more opportunities, but get the info that you need because this is where we're heading as a church, and we'd love to have you along for the journey. So may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he cause his face to shine upon you, May he be gracious unto you and lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Let's worship the Lord and have a great Sunday.